Thank you. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming, and thanks so much to the, the Blender Foundation and everyone who's been, been putting this together. It's been, been amazing to see all the talks today. Uh, my name's Kevin Kress, and I'm uh, presenting um, some of the work of the, the Living Architecture Systems Group, and I wanted to give a, a little bit of a thank you to uh, some of my other collaborators who couldn't be here before I start the presentation. Uh, so uh, Philip Beasley, Timothy Boll, and Matt Gorbett, who have been sort of really influential in the, the work I'm about to, to describe. Um, so uh, this talk is titled uh, An Open Software Ecosystem for Designing Living Architecture. And before I get into the talk, I just want to talk a little bit about um, what the Living Architecture Systems Group is and what we mean when we say living architecture. Um, so our group is an international partnership of uh, researchers, artists, and industrial collaborators. Um, and we're interested in studying how we can build sustainable, adaptive environments that can move, respond, and learn, and that are inclusive and empathetic towards their inhabitants. Um, so we try out a bunch of different um, fabrication methods for making lightweight structures, modeling methods, um, behavioral systems for these uh, living architecture test beds that are produced. Um, and so these test beds are sort of uh, large canopies. They're, they're sort of uh, cultural, sculptural spaces. Um, that, that respond to, to visitors as they, as they move through them and interact with them. And they have a, a variety of software tools that help drive their behavior um, and contribute to their, um, to their production and interaction. And so um, a lot of this work uh, can be kind of summed up in a, in a couple of simple diagrams. So typically for architecture, we look at um, sort of these, these static boundaries, this sort of delineation between inside and outside. Uh, and you have this sort of static structure that, that delineates between the two. Um, and at the Living Architecture Systems Group, we're really interested in exploring um, how those boundaries can expand and start to become porous, can start to allow energy flows between the interior and the exterior, and how these environments can become a little more open, a little more um, interactive. And so a bit about myself, uh, when I started using Blender, I think I fit very much in this sort of static box method. It was sort of my tool that I love to use for absolutely everything. You know, if I was doing modelings, if I was doing renderings, if I was doing photo editing, you know, I just defaulted to Blender because it was this fantastic tool. It had everything I could possibly need in it, um, except for one thing. So I gave a talk back in uh, 2019 about adding some architectural dimensioning and um, drawing tools to Blender, because that was sort of the one thing that I, I couldn't do with it, and I wanted to be able to do everything inside this tool. But as I've started working with the Living Architecture Systems Group, I've found that you know, when you're working in an interdisciplinary practice, um, you know, and especially when you're doing shorter term collaborations, you can't just sort of, you know, everybody's got their software tool that they know really well and they like to use, so you can't just kind of expect everyone to come and and work in your platform, you've got to start to open those boundaries. Um, and Blender, being the phenomenal tool that it is, makes it really easy and really simple for us to start to, to expand those things uh, and build out. So uh, I want to talk about sort of our history of Blender and, and how we've been using it in the studio um, by talking about uh, four of the Living Architecture Systems Group's test beds. Uh, and these are these sort of immersive environments that are designed by architect and artist Philip Beasley. Um, so we've got uh, two, one in Meander, which is in Cambridge in Canada, um, R for Reef, which is in, uh, in France, uh, Grove, which was an exhibition for the Venice Biennale, and Poetic Vale, which is in uh, Tilburg in the Netherlands. So uh, Meander is the first project, um, and I came in uh, to this project about partway through. Uh, it's this sort of large central grotto made up of a couple of spheres. Uh, and this sort of large, expansive canopy that's over an event space. Um, and the role of Blender in this project, I'll start the video there, um, was really as a visualization tool, sort of after the fact. Um, part of the Living Architecture Systems Group's um, uh, really mandates is to not just make these spaces, make these test beds, but to communicate how they work, how they function. Um, and what's, what's going on inside them, so that they're not just these sort of black box spaces um, 
so that we can really communicate to people so that they understand how they work. Um, so we produced these series of animated visualizations in Blender, uh, and these run sort of on some display boards in the space to kind of communicate what each of the sensors and actuators are doing and how they're, how they're responding to people's engagement. And we found we were able to create um, sort of a fairly high fidelity um, model of the, of the sculpture of the test bed using Blender. So for the next project, for, um, for our Fru Reef um, in, in Le Fru in France, uh, we decided to use Blender more for the schematic design phase of the project. Um, so we started out um, modeling the, the sort of canopies of this space. Uh, we used sort of a, a sculpted plane to define sort of the overall gesture, uh, and then some sort of simple hex grid geometries with particle systems uh, driven using weight painting so that we could really sort of gesturally define um, what the movements of these different components would be throughout the space and how they, how they would look. So um, these are just a couple of images of some sort of previous renderings that we did. Um, but what we found was that translating that sort of very sculptural, very gestural blender model into sort of the technical documentation that the team needed to actually construct the test bed um, provided some challenges. You know, if we exported via FBX or OBJ or any of these sort of more standard file formats, uh, a lot of the hierarchical information that was really key to the design of the sculpture got sort of crunched down and made these sort of very difficult to work with files that were, were challenging for the team to take into, you know, Rhino or Fusion 360 to, to really build out the industrial design of the sculpture. Um, so that led us to produce uh, what we're calling the Living Architecture Systems Description. It's a, a custom exchange format that we've been working on that's based in JSON. And it's this hierarchical model uh, description of the sculpture that talks about the device design, the spatial design, the behavioral design, and the sort of lexicon of components and assemblies uh, that make up each of these test beds. And what that description allows us to do is, because it's very lightweight, we can use it to uh, derive different models in different software platforms, whether that's, you know, in Rhino for, for documentation or in Blender for visualization or, you know, in Unreal or Unity or Godot for sort of more interactive applications or in our custom behavioral uh, modeling tools. So a quick example of how that system sort of works. Um, this is uh, one of the, the sort of spheres um, that you can see in some of the test beds in Meander and others. Um, and it looks quite complex. You know, there's a lot of components, a lot going on. Um, but if you start to break that down, you realize it's a lot of repeated components. Um, so the underlying geometry that defines these spheres is one of the Archimedean polyhedra. It's a truncated icosahedron, uh, which I think lots of people are familiar with because it's the, um, the basic form of a soccer ball, or I guess I should say a football. Um, and so it's a, a pentagon surrounded by hexagons. And so each of those hexagons is what we call a sphere unit. Uh, and then we can break that down even further. Uh, each of those sphere units is comprised of multiples of these, these spars that get tied together, and each of those is comprised of a subset of components. And so in Blender, we represent this through um, collection and collection instances uh, and sort of hierarchies of those. And in Rhino, that same sort of assembly can be represented through blocks and block instances. And uh, once we got this working, it allowed us to sort of very quickly round trip between uh, between Blender and Rhino. And so you can see, and you know, if you attach a unique ID to these things as well, um, it, it allows you to, to actually update models sort of on the fly between the two softwares, which has been fantastic for our working methods. And so that kind of brings us, and once we realized we could do that with the, the geometry data, with the spatial data, we realized we could also um, embed some of the behavioral systems um, and information for those as well into, these, uh, into this data representation. Um, so this is um, a view of one of the, the behavioral control systems. It has to be spatialized so that these, um, these lights and actuators can respond spatially to, to different sort of energy flows modeled in the, in the environment. And we can use the same LASD file to, to inform those systems and, and give them their spatial layout. And this brings us to, to the next project, which was uh, Grove. Uh, Grove was part of the Venice Biennale in, in 2021. 
Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, we had some restrictions on you know, how we could access the site and how, the, how we could actually do the construction. Um, so it's this sort of large canopy. Um, there's a, an extended array of, of speakers throughout the space uh, with a wonderful spatialized sound composition done by Salvador Breed uh, and a film projected down into the center uh, done by Warren de Perez and Nick Thornton Jones. And we use Blender quite a bit for uh, previs so that we could you know, make sure we had a really strong understanding of how this was going to look in the space. Um, so both sort of wireframe previs and uh, rendered previs as well. And uh, one thing that was really, really interesting about this process was usually we do lighting design sort of on site uh, for projects. And it's very sort of fluid. Um, Philip's a fantastic lighting designer. Um, but for this, because we couldn't be in the space, we had to do it all uh, remotely. Uh, and all of these lighting cues had to be synced with the film that was being projected in the center, and that was being done in Touch Designer, and we needed a way to, to visualize how that was going to look in the space. So we were able to connect Touch Designer and Blender together using OSC messaging so that we could visualize in real time how these Touch Designer patches that were driving the DMX light controls um, would, would appear in the space. And we used sort of Eevee's real-time rendering to, to drive that. Another portion of this project was uh, the Grove Cradle film that we collaborated on uh, with Warren de Perez and Nick Thornton-Jones. And uh, we were able to use the LASD to um, send this sort of very detailed model of one of the sculptural uh, test beds um, that we produced in Blender. And we were able to um, convert that into um, a set of instance blueprints in Unreal Engine as well using this, um, using this exchange format. And uh, this is a sort of short excerpt that I'll, excerpt that I'll play of the film. Um, and I'll play a longer piece at the end if there's time. So the film sort of shows this, um, what are these test beds sort of through cycles of life, death, and rebirth, and how, they, um, how it might evolve over time. Um, the final project that I'll talk about is uh, Poetic Veil, vale, which is at the Textile Museum in Tilburg. That's just about two hours from here. Uh, we just finished it a couple of weeks ago, so I've been uh, in the Netherlands quite a bit this last month. Um, and again, sort of a really lovely, very dense canopy. Um, within this room. This was some of the previs that we'd done in Blender, a couple of renderings uh, mixed with a bit of, of Photoshop work, bringing in images of, of previous test beds. And it's just a quick, uh, quick fly through of our, of our Blender model. Um, the system was really using uh, the LASD quite a bit to, uh, to allow us to move back and forth between Blender and Rhino. Um, we worked with uh, one of our designers, Adrian Chu, who worked on the, the sort of central garland system um, that sort of arches over uh, another exhibition uh, of a dress by Iris Van Herpen. Um, and this allowed us to sort of work quite freely back and forth between Blender and Rhino. Um, we also engaged with some custom tools that we've been developing uh, in the creation of this sculpture. Um, so a system that we're calling the, the LAPL, uh, which is being built in Godot Engine, which is, allows us to very quickly sort of um, sketch out um, some of these crenellated forms and these shapes, uh, and then use sort of a mass spring simulation to, to start to regularize those polygons and see what the curvature is going to be like of those shapes. Um, and then again, using, using a sort of JSON export system, we can export that data um, out just to a very lightweight 
lightweight mesh description and bring it back into Blender for, for final population. Um, and you can see it comes in uh, just as the sort of triangulated spring net. Um, and then we fill that, and then we've been using the tissue add-on quite a bit to, to sort of regenerate the dual mesh of that to give us our, our uh, pentagonal and hexagonal grids back uh, for sort of further instancing and work. And there's just a couple, couple more images of the test bed. And there's some quite evocative shadow play. Um, so another aspect of the work that is sort of still in development at Tilburg is a, a project that we're calling uh, Living Shadows, which is sort of working between Godot Engine and Blender um, to create these sort of fictional animated shadows that exist in the same space as the, as the real physical test bed. So you've got the actual object, and then its, it's shadows on the wall are being augmented through projection mapping. Um, and we're able to do this because we have such high fidelity models that we're developing in the schematic design phase in Blender. So we have, um, you know, these, these really detailed digital twins um, of the actual physical components that allow us to do this work. Um, so we can create this sort of digital double in this virtual world. Um, and, you know, we're doing a lot of the animation of the sort of life, life cycles of these creatures, these virtual creatures in Blender. Um, and it also allows us to, to do some sort of targeted lighting animation as well um, that's generated through, through the projection on some of the glass vessels within the, the objects. And, you know, because all of these, these entities, these virtual entities are sharing sort of a shared world, um, our sort of lead behavior designer, uh, Matt Gorbett, calls it a, a spatialized digital milieu. Um, these things, these sort of virtual creatures can, can interact with the actual physical components. So they can be sort of scared away by somebody interacting with one of the physical components, or they can fly close to it and cause them to light up uh, and respond. And that's uh, just about the end of the talk. Um, and so thanks so much for having me. Um, Blender's been tremendously helpful in sort of the work of the systems group in uh, you know, really working on these types of interactive environments that can just prompt us to uh, to have a bit of wonder and a bit of um, speculation about how spaces might might interact with us and respond to us. Um, if you'd like to know more about the work that we've been doing, uh, you can find us at lasg.ca. Uh, we try and publish a lot of the work that we do, so we have a, a series of folios, um, sort of short PDF documents on, on each of these projects. Uh, and there's quite a lot more images and, and content available on each of them if you're interested. And if there is a bit of time, um, I'd just like to, to leave a longer excerpt of the, the film Cradle playing uh, just to, to end things Deep off. So thank you very much.
Thank you.